Now a regenerative preselector is a lot like a regenerative receiver. You have a regeneration control which adjusts the amount of feedback and uh, takes you very close to oscillation. You don't actually go into oscillation but you want to get close to oscillation so you can multiply the Q of the circuit and effectively amplify the, uh, the station or exalt the station above the other signals that you want. Okay, so uh, let me just turn this down. WCBS coming out of New York. Um, in part two, we're going to uh, continue with the solid state uh, pre selector. And uh, the TRF, of uh, course, can be transformed uh, uh, into a vacuum tube circuit. Of course, the vacuum tube circuit came first, but uh, we're showing it second in the video. So here in part two, uh, we're going to take the transistorized TRF and we're going to convert it into a tube type using a 1U4 tube. Before we get there, we've got a little more to discuss with the solid state version, um, especially in regard to stability and bias. And uh, regeneration uh, is really a form of instability that we harness to give us even more gain and selectivity. So you might remember we were using a very simple form of bias called feedback biasing. That works pretty well at room temperature where we're using these devices. We're not shooting these things off to the moon and uh, the bias can be quite simple with RF circuits since we're only operating with minute signals. So we'll stick with that type of bias on the input stage. As you can see, we're not actually turning the transistor completely on into the middle of the load line. We're just bringing it down into the load line enough that we can handle our signals. So we'll stick with this simple bias from now on. Remember, the transistor does need to be turned on, so always check the collector to see that it's not railed at 3 volts. In our case, we're using a 3 volt supply but it's below 3 volts, say at 2.5 or 2.6 volts. That gives us enough room for our RF signals. Okay, just for uh, due diligence, uh, we've got a 2N2222 A metal. It's a 2N2219 in a TO39 package. I've got a few PNP transistors. Uh, the BMP transistor can go right in the place of the MPN. You just have to reverse the power supply. Now, I reverse the power supply by just flipping the batteries and then jamming in some pieces of wire so that it would make contact. You generally cannot reverse batteries in a battery holder because the, uh, the, uh, you know, the contact won't be uh, set up for that. But by jamming some wire in there, I now have negative 3 volts instead of positive 3 volts. Okay, let me turn on the power amp. CBS military analyst retired Colonel Jeff McCausland about whether there's a real threat things could escalate. Absolutely. I mean, I have I've conducted a whole series of high-level negotiations with very, very senior Indian Okay, this is a 2N2905. The venerable 2N3906. 3906 PMP transistor. Okay, the 2N2907. So the real trick is keeping them stable so they do not oscillate in our circuit. Um, we have plenty of gain. <laughs> we just don't have a lot of stability. So that's why we had to use the uh, unbypassed emitter resistor, uh, which acts to degenerate or lower the gain of the of the stage to a point where it's in a safe region. So doing some due diligence to make sure this thing is going to be stable with different transistors. I tested it with a, a second 3904 and uh, a 2222 and I found that one of the 3904s that I tested um, it was acting unstable with really strong signals. So let's take a listen to that. Perhaps, but I don't fall for that technique. 
somebody says, I think you'll have to agree. No, I yeah. don't have to agree. We know that there's something, think something not right here. Because if I put my hand in there, it settles down. So there's definitely some there's definitely some instability going on there. So if we check that transistor's gain or perhaps its cutoff frequency, it's going to be significantly different or higher than the other transistors that we've tested in the system. Um, and people uh, might be saying, well, can't you make a circuit that's pretty much bulletproof? Well, that's not what this is about, really. We're trying to use a, a generic transistor, and we're trying to use as few parts as we can and come up with a, a serviceable uh, circuit that's not going to be uh, too complex. And uh, I think if we were doing this and we had no limitations and no constraints, we might use a different device, we might use a different topology, we might use many more parts, but a single bipolar transistor, you know, the garden variety 3904 or 2N2222, you're going to find tremendous variations, and this can cause some trouble sometimes. So we need to know what to do when we run into trouble with oscillations, uh, parasitics, and so on, uh, and how to snub them out, or how to eliminate them, and allow the circuit to work. Now the first method is to use a low value resistor like this 10 ohm carbon film resistor and put that right in series with the base of the transistor. And so it goes between the uh, output of the coil from that capacitor into the base of the transistor. Um, you could also use a ferrite bead there to try to snub some parasitics. This is basically discouraging uh, high frequency oscillation. Another method is to put a parallel impedance on the collector side of the transistor. Either uh, right from the output capacitor to ground or over on the crystal radio. Uh, let's try that method with this. Okay, we're going to take take it. Okay. So what we've done is we've taken a 1 kilo ohm, 1 k ohm resistor and we're simply putting it across the input to the crystal radio. Now the input to that crystal radio is very low impedance. This is a small coil. So the 1 kilo ohm is not going to hurt the signal at all. It, uh, it's invisible to the signal because it's such a high impedance. Um, but what it will do is it will uh, provide a better broadband match for what we've created here, which is more or less a transmission line. And that, that uh, resistor uh, apparently is taking care of the problem that we're having with the feedback. Remember, when you have a tune circuit on the input of an active device and a tune circuit on the output of an active device, and they both have fairly high Q, there's a good chance you're going to get some feedback to the input and you're going to make an oscillator. And that's what's happened here. So just by putting a resistor across and terminating that line, we're acting to snub out uh, the oscillations from this particular transistor. Not every transistor is going to have trouble. So uh, that's a couple of methods for um, for reducing the oscillations.
Of course, we can always increase the value of the emitter resistor, which is a 330 ohm. We could take that up to a 470 ohm or a 680 or even a 1K. That reduces the gain of the circuit, which is another way to get rid of the oscillation. Of course, we don't want to reduce the gain. We want all the gain we can get out of this. So another thing that, uh, that we're up against here, this is not really a proper construction method for a high frequency amplifier. Um, there's no ground plane at all. Um, so it's, the system doesn't have a good ground reference and it's fairly easy for the transistor to get into a state where it will regenerate, oscillate, make noise and do other things that uh, we don't like. That's why we're having to use a fairly large capacitor at this point, the point one uh, that's from the, uh, the B plus feed to ground. Um, that's a very important capacitor. Uh, without that, uh, the circuit was readily going into oscillation. As a matter of fact, it became what's known as a regenerative preselector, which is a very high Q preselector. If we were to put a potentiometer at this point in the uh, in the emitter of the transistor, we could actually add a regeneration control to the amplifier. So that's, uh, that's another idea. The next step is to remove the transistor and replace it with a tube. And I've decided to use a 1U4, which is a remote cutoff pentode. It's similar to the 1L4, which is an earlier version of a battery tube. These tubes are nice because you can light them up with 1.5 volts and they don't need much plate voltage at all. So uh, this was traditionally used as the uh, IF amplifiers and sometimes the RF stage in portable battery receivers in the uh, mid 40s to uh, late 50s. So it's not a real power hungry tube and it should work well as a preamplifier tube in our TRF uh, stage. And the European equivalent of the 1U4 is the DF92. So what we're looking at here is the vacuum tube version of the tuned RF stage. And I'm using uh, the 1U4 tube. Uh, the 1U4 in an RF amplifier service wants some voltage. Uh, it's, you're not going to get away with putting 27 volts on the tube like you might with a regenerative receiver or a simple audio amplifier. You got to put some significant voltage on there. And I found that you need at least uh, at least 50 volts to get things going. I'm actually running it on my power supply at pretty much full blast, about 45 volts on there. And uh, it would like to see 67 to 90 volts on the plate of the 1U4. The uh, 1.5 volt battery lights the filament no problem and lasts a long time and so on. Because this is a battery tube. We aren't drawing a lot of current. It only draws about 3 milliamps on the plate, so it's not like you're going to take your batteries down. You could make a stack of 9 volt batteries and come up with a voltage that would make this happy. The circuit is almost indestructible. I found that uh, you can vary the grid resistor from 1 meg all the way up to 4.7 meg with no noticeable difference in the bias. You can even short out R3 completely. It still seems to work. A uh, very forgiving circuit uh, to get working. Compared to the transistor circuit, it doesn't seem to have quite as much gain, but it's much more stable at the same time. So,
but it's just as selective. Um, we do not need to tap down the coil like we did before uh, with the tube. You're right up at the top of the coil using all of it right on the hot side of the variable capacitor. So here's an equivalent circuit uh, using a tube. So you get a feel for how to tune the uh, TRF? So what we're looking at now is a 1AD4 sub-miniature tube, sub-miniature. These tubes were developed uh, during the uh, late 40s, early 50s to be put into portable equipment like uh, small walkie-talkies, uh, seismic equipment, anything that was portable or battery operated that also had to be miniature. And uh, this is a 184 tube that we've got kind of jerry-rigged into the, uh, the miniature socket and it's making contact and it is working. And this is roughly equivalent to the 1U4. But I wanted to show you that you can use these sub-mini tubes and uh, have a lot of fun with them. Uh, with these types of uh, battery circuits, and they last even longer on uh, on batteries. After big tech, she wants to break up Amazon, Plenty Google, of game. and Facebook. But I'll tell you what, she'll never and, break uh, up big education. She will not touch Harvard's. Again, they uh, they use very low current, both in the plate and in the filament circuit. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm looking at the. Um, the typical characteristics for filament. Uh, 1.25 volts at 0.1 amps. That's 100 milliamps for the filament. And uh, typically uh, the plate voltage of 45 volts uh, for typical operation. This, this tube seems much happier than the 1U4 operating at the uh, 45 volts. Seems to have a little bit more gain. Skies in Boston at 1.30. Good afternoon, I'm Sherry Small. Here's what's happening. The funeral for Jassy Correa was held today at St. Peter's Church in Dorchester. Yeah, and the Raytheon 184 sub-miniature tube. It's a very difficult day for So what we have here is the experimental regenerative preselector. A regenerative preselector is basically like a regenerative receiver, except instead of detecting, uh, we use it as an as an amplifier, and we take the output off the uh, collector side of the uh, of the transistor that is regenerating. In this case, we're running it into an emitter follower. As you can see, the circuit's uh, quite a bit more complex than our, our simple single transistor circuit. Thursday night at 8 p.m. 7 Central for the Radio Music Awards. 
It's much like a regen. Uh, the regenerative press selector uh, gives tremendous gain and the selectivity is to the point where you actually start to cut the sidebands and the audio becomes uh, somewhat muted. team. Oh, this and that. He can't have it both ways, okay? That's not the way the... So, with the regenerative preselector, the input is the center tap, and we're using the, uh, the 100 turn tap. The 125 turn tap is not used, just as before. The big difference is that the feedback is occurring within these first five turns. So we've got five turns and a new center tap that is our feedback path. So really we need a 100 turn coil with a center tap. The top of the 100 turns is going to the variable. The center tap is going to the input. And about five turns up that's our feedback. So uh, we end up needing a coil that has four wires. So it's the top of the coil, the bottom of the coil, which is grounded, a middle tap, and then a tap just up five turns. And that's, that's what you need for, uh, for doing a Hartley-style regenerative preselector. So also the, the bias on the two stages, we have about 3 volts on the, on the uh, collector, with 3 volts uh, we bias the transistor so that we're down around 2.8, 2.7, 2.5, we do not need to be uh, biasing right in the middle at 1.5, but uh, just Getting a few hundred millivolts below the rail uh, is adequate for the input stage. And then on the output stage, we want to have at least 300, 400, 500 millivolts uh, to work with on the uh, emitter of the emitter follower. So we're not uh, super heavily biased with this circuit. We're just tickling the bias enough so that uh, all the stages work in uh, Class A fashion. So uh, stand by for some more interesting videos. So we're not quite done with the crystal set yet. We've got a little more to explore.